Hello and welcome to another episode of Better Red Than Dead, the Generation Liberty book club show. On today's episode, we are going to be discussing Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, just in time for the festive season. This book explores the character of Scrooge as he is visited by four spirits, and I am absolutely grateful and thankful to have two amazing guests with me to discuss this book, starting with the British columnist and professional feather ruffler, Brendan O'Neill. Thank you for being on the show, Brendan. My pleasure. And also from the Generation Liberty team, we have the wonderful Luca Rossi from Monash University. Thanks very much for having me on, Renee. Brendan, in Australia, you can already kind of see the impact of Dickens and the story. We grew up with the stories, you know, even here in Australia. But what was his, um, what kind of figure was he like growing up in Britain? Like how much of a giant was he? you know, during your schooling years and, you know, culturally across England? Oh, huge, absolutely vast figure, um, second only to Shakespeare, of course. Um, just today, for example, I'm speaking to you in the evening time here in London, and just today I walked past two huge Dickens-related monuments. I walked through Marlebone in central London where there is a, a huge uh, 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 Dickens a mural on the house where he used to live, which features some of the characters from A Christmas Carol. And I also walked past um, Oxford Street, where one of the main plays that's on over Christmas is a new musical production of A Christmas Carol. So you can't really escape Dickens in London. There are streets named after Dickens all over the place. There's Dorrit Street, um, there's Copperfield Street, there's Ebenezer Street, although there's some disagreement over whether Ebenezer Street is actually named after Ebenezer Scrooge. Um, one of my favorite pubs is called the Betsy Trotwood, where I often go. That's obviously named after a character from David Copperfield. And in, in schools, every kid reads a Dickens novel. The, the one that is most commonly read is Great Great Expectations, which is one of my all-time favourite novels. We read that in school. All kids read Dickens. You're surrounded by his uh, his ideas, his words, and um, there are museums built where he used to live. One of them in Kent was attacked during the Black Lives Matter uprising over the summer. Someone wrote Dickens, Dickens was a racist outside uh, one of the houses where he used to live. And that caused a huge storm because people in Britain love Charles Dickens. Um, so he's huge. And I think even Christmas itself in London feels very Dickensian. As you were saying, um, he didn't invent Christmas. That's an exaggeration. There was a film a few years ago called The Man Who Invented Christmas, which was about Charles Dickens and, and the period in which he wrote A Christmas Carol. I think that's going too far, but he definitely consolidated a lot of Christmas traditions. He kind of brought them together and he popularized Christmas and he gave people a sense of what Christmas should really be like. So even as you walk through London and you see the huge tree in Trafalgar Square and all these old rickety streets that Dickens himself would have walked down covered in decorations and Christmas imagery, the whole thing feels very Dickensian. So um, Dickens has an extraordinary influence in the UK uh, uh, constantly all the time. It is amazing how much impact one one writer can have over culture and still have that impact today. And, you know, we still use the term Scrooge to mean someone mm. who's kind of tight-fisted today. But, Luca, we're talking about, the you know, kind of the influence that Dickens has, and this story is so well known to everyone. I think it's one of the books where I'm not going to have to give much of a plot summary, and I can't even remember being conscious of Christmas without being conscious of this story, I think. So why do you think it's still important to read the original text when there's so many film adaptions and other ways that you can kind of ingest this tale? So I think the main thing about reading the book is that you come to understand yourself better through going through that same progression that Scrooge does, which is probably why that book was so huge in its day, because people connected with that especially in a really divided society, people connected with that. And they realize that, you know, I can be both Scrooge on one side and Tiny Tim on the other side, or I can be Cratchit. I can be giving, but I can also be, you know, stingy and a miser. So how do I make myself better? What kind of progression do I have to go to to make myself a more giving and open person? 
Yeah, it's really interesting you say that because, yeah, Dickens does kind of go to extremes with his characters. His villains are, are villains and his heroes are heroes. But I think that's all kind of deliberate in a way where they're a representation of a part of you or a part of yourself that you can identify with. Brendan, why would you say is the, is the important reason to still go back and read the actual text? Um, well, it's a great book. Um, it's as I agree with you, it's the easiest Dickens book to read. It's very simple in, in I mean, it's very deep in the way that Luca just described uh, in terms of what it invites the reader to do. Uh, but it's a very simple story at the same time. Um, and it's a very universal story because it is fundamentally about redemption and the possibility of redemption and the possibility of radical moral transformation through self-reflection, through revelation. Those, those are what the ghosts of the past, the present and the future represent, the, the revelation of the self in sometimes an unflattering light and then the, um, the tendency or the hope of redemption. Uh, I think it, one thing that strikes me about the novel, there's, a, there's been an ongoing historical debate about whether it is um, religious or secular um, and of course, it's infused with um, Christian imagery and Christian ideas. But as many historians have pointed out, or many uh, literary critics have pointed out, Dickens doesn't beat you over the head with a Christian message. And so it has a secular feel to it, too. It, it, it's not dogmatic. It's not a dogmatic story of Christian redemption. There is um, a, a more universal humanistic message to the ideal of redemption, which of course is the redemption of Scrooge, who realizes the error of his ways. Um, and I think it, the other the, re the other reason it's important, or the other reason it, it's worth looking back back on it and thinking about it, is also in relation to what Dickens did to the novel more broadly. I mean, he did largely reinvent the novel. This particular one was incredibly popular. He made it, he produced it himself um, in terms of the first ish, first edition because he was in dispute with his publishers. So he produced it himself. He made it incredibly cheap so that everyone could buy it, whether they were rich or poor. And it was, uh, it was a, uh, you know, hugely, hugely popular. Of course, lots of people criticize Dickens for being a sentimentalist. And it is quite a sentimental novel. Apparently, Lenin, uh, the Russian revolutionary, apparently he was read um, sections of Christmas Carol on his deathbed and he was repelled by its bourgeois sentimentality as he referred to it. George Orwell, who is my hero, um, is also someone who has criticized Dickens for his sentimentality while also recognizing that Dickens propelled the poor into literature in a way that uh, hadn't been done previously. So there's also that discussion. There's the discussion of um, how serious Dickens' morality is when he has this tendency towards sentimentality. Now, as it happens, I'm a bit of a sucker for sentimentality, so I don't mind that. But that tussle, I think, that there are so many tussles going on in this novel. Firstly, there is Scrooge's tussle with himself. There is also the question of whether this is a Christian or a secular tale, or maybe a bit of both. And then there is also the question of how moral it is or, or whether the sentimentality of it sometimes washes over the morality. So there is so much going on in this novel. It, it's always worth rereading. It's always worth talking about. And it's worth reading what other people have said about it too, because that's when you start to realise it's an incredibly layered work of literature. I was kind of struck by the idea that people in our lives kind of play the, the ghost of Christmas past um, at times. And I know when I see for, for perhaps my brother, um, and we had a kind of, I'll say difficult childhood, but whenever we get together, um, we just talk about put, piecing it together. Um, and I think a lot of people have, you know, maybe objects in their lives or people in their lives that kind of do that from them. And the reason, Scrooge needs a spirit to come do that is because he's separated himself so much from people. So he needs almost a supernatural being to come and, and, and go through these memories with him for him to kind of realise and reflect. But Brendan, do you find that you ever like that this is kind of a metaphor for something that we actually do ourselves going through this journey of going through our past memories? 
Um, definitely, I think so. And um, I, I completely agree that part of the ghost of Christmas past, it, it represents the function of memory and the sometimes unreliable function of memory and the way in which we tend to reflect on our own lives in a way that suits what we need in the present very often. And I think there's a large part of that in this part of the novel. Um, of course, it also, it, it kind of presents Scrooge to us as what we might call damaged goods in modern therapeutic language, because of course it also takes us back to his great heartbreak and the fact that he lost the love of his life, uh, Belle, who is now uh, married and, and seems quite happy and so on. And, and that's the part of his past that he finds most unbearable. Um, and that's when he tries to push away this ghost, but he can't push the ghost away because um, memory is not something you can just extinguish. It's always going to be there. Those those images are always going to be there. So I thought the, uh, the failure to, or the inability to put this ghost to one side, I think is really quite important. But I think the the real, I think that part of the novel plays both a narrative function in the sense that it gives us Scrooge's potted personal history and tells us that he is pretty damaged himself. And that's possibly why he ended up such a miserable, miserly creature. Um, but it also is the way in which Dickens it ignites the moral questions. And the moral questions fundamentally are, can individuals change? Can they become something else? Or is there is fate written for them? So I think there's something about this novel. One reason I think it's quite uplifting is because, um, you know, Scrooge's life, his his destiny is not written in stone. And um, just to contrast it with the more therapeutic outlook that we might have today, um, very often today, we have this idea that someone who suffers a terrible incident in their childhood or a lost love or some kind of trauma, that it's incredibly difficult for them to escape that and that and it will define them for the rest of their lives and what this novel does as most well much great literature does is demonstrate the capacity of individuals to overcome um character traits traumatic experiences lost loves and become something else become something better so that that transformative element i think is very important and strikes a very humanistic note particularly in comparison with lots of the stuff we read and hear about today but moving on to our second spirit luca i thought you might want to introduce the um joyous uh next spirit the ghost of christmas present well, the ghost of Christmas present, he seems like a pretty good bloke, not going to lie. Um, you know, he, the first time you meet him, interestingly, he doesn't go, at, he doesn't come into Scrooge's room and meets him. He actually waits for him to come to him, which is rather interesting, I think. Again, it's one of the reasons you kind of have to read the book version. But one of the other things that's really important about this segment of the book is um, going to visit Bob Cratchit's family. Uh, Brendan, what do you think is the significance of that segment and how Dickens portrays um, the family that Scrooge goes to visit? Yeah, the Cratchits, I think they're very interesting. Um, I mean, crudely speaking, they are they symbolise working class Londoners. Um, you know, this was the time of the Industrial Revolution. Life was incredibly, even though I think the Industrial Revolution was arguably the greatest leap forward in human history. Um, it was a very difficult period, you know, great cities in the UK like London and Sheffield and Manchester and Liverpool, these became uh, hotbeds of poverty and hard work and early death and all those kinds of things. So I think Dickens was incredibly sensitive to that, very concerned about those problems. And the Cratchit symbolized some of that to a certain extent. Um, uh, the I think, or, uh, just to go back to Orwell for a moment, Orwell wrote a brilliant essay um, in the 1930s, I think, or maybe the 1940s, about, uh, it was about whether socialists can ever be happy. And it was a bit of a taking the mick out of socialists for always being a bit miserable. And he mentions the Cratchits and he says, um, one thing he loves about the Cratchits in A Christmas Carol is he says Dickens depicts their happiness on Christmas Day really, really well. Um, and he contrasts that to other um, socially aware activists and writers of Dickens, Dickens' time who tended to be incredibly miserable. And so 
he Orwell admired the happiness of the Cratchits at this moment, and he recognized that the reason they're happy at that moment is because for the first time in a long time, they have enough food to eat, they're together as a family, they're taking joy and pleasure from these rather simple activities. So Dickens really celebrates that uh, family connection, the bonds that they have, the, the their willingness and their desire to look after Tiny Tim, all these things which contrasts with um, Scrooge, who has none of that, and who may be wealthy, but doesn't spend his money, doesn't have any connection. So I think um, the contrast between, I guess you would call it the salt of the earth nature of the Cratchits with the uh, miserly approach to everything uh, uh, with, in, in relation to Scrooge, I think that's a very important device in terms of really telling us where the moral anchor of the story is. And I think a lot of it lies with the Cratchits and what they help to reveal to Scrooge. I think Dickens is very good at, at portraying them here and, and making them their situation realistic, but they're not victims. They're, they've still got agency over themselves. And it is nice to see how joyous they are in contrast to, you know, the very wealthy Scrooge who has none of the things that actually matter in life. But going to the concept of the present, while reading this book, I was continuously kind of struck by the morals within it and their relevance to today's present. Um, and one of the particular ones that struck me was actually a quote from The Ghost of Christmas Present, um, which I think everyone's kind of heard um, the line by Scrooge, well, you know, if they'd rather die, then they better do it and decrease the surplus population. Um, and then The Ghost of Christmas Present kind of takes him up on that on that point, and I'll read from the book, he says, If man you be at heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked, can't until you have discovered what that surplus is and where it is, will you decide what man shall live and what men shall die? Um, and when I was reading that segment, I just thought, I, I really feel like all the people in the extreme environmentalist movement really need to read this part of the book uh, because we hear that more and more these days, um, especially in really concerningly from the young, this concept of human are a, humans are a plague on this planet or there's too many people, there's too much population. And when people say that, I just want to say to them, do you realise what you're saying? Like, who, who, where is this excess population that, that you want to get rid of. Um, so Brenda, did you notice that at all when you were reading and is there any other morals that you, you saw in the book that you thought were particularly timely to now? Yeah, I think that's that section of the, of the book is incredibly striking and really, really important because of course Dicking, Dickens would have been surrounded by those kind of extreme ideas as well because um, Thomas Malthus, who was the original population scaremonger who wrote his population treaties in um, 1798. Um, he was incredibly influential. He would have been very, very influential in the kind of circles Dickens will have, will have been moving in, um, upper middle class circles in particular. And Malthus, who obviously gave rise to Malthusianism, um, put forward the idea that there was not enough natural resources to feed humanity and therefore there would be a surplus population and it would die out one way or another. And in A Christmas Carol, it's very clearly, Dickens is very clearly rebuking Malthus um, and sending a signal to the sections of London society who will have been fairly Malthusian. He's saying to them, listen, this is not right. This is not a good way to look at the poor as simply a surplus population to be dealt with. And that's why I think the ghost of Christmas present is really important too, because I think the ghost of Christmas present plays a, a, an important political role in the in the novel in the story um, because of course one of the things he does is he shows Scrooge um, a marketplace in London which is full of the most extraordinary food and Dickens describes the food in great detail luscious pears and apples and all this stuff um, and then he goes from there to uh, the Cratchit's home where there is not really much food and so what Dickens is essentially saying is the problem is social, not natural. There is plenty food, there is plenty stuff to go around, and yet some people don't have any. And this was, uh, Dickens was a pretty socially aware person. This was him very clearly saying no to Malthusianism and holding up the, 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 the distinct possibility that humankind could feed everyone if it wanted to. 
And I think you're right. Those backward Malthusian ideas have completely trickled down into modern day environmentalism, which pushes the same argument that Thomas Malthus pushed, which is that there is only so many natural resources to, to go around and eventually we'll run out and everyone will die. Dickens would not have had much time for those kinds of arguments because in his view, the world was full of wonderful stuff and, and uh, it, it was a world of abundance. The problem was that some people were denied access to that abundance because of the social organization of society. So there's a very positive message there. And I think the ghost of Christmas present is almost like a pro-market character or, or almost like a, a pro-free market character. And um, lots of capitalist thinkers over the years have made that argument because essentially what that ghost says is, um, the only limitations to uh, liberating people from poverty is is really the social imagination. And I think that part of the story is, is Dickens nailing his colours to the mast and saying, I'm not a Malthusian. I believe that humanity is good and is capable. A lot of um, people on the left would actually see this book as a criticism of indus the industrial capitalism of the time. Um, what well, I kind of agree with Brendan there that there's actually a lot of um, in favour of in capitalism and the market in this book. What are your thoughts on that? I think at the heart of it, it's I think it's it's really important to delve into it and find you know messages about the way society should be run and things. Well, you know that that's what it's about society and stuff. But but that's the thing. It's like. I think it's important that when we're having the kinds of discussions about the economic views of Dickens and things like that, to not forget the fact that Christmas Carol is fundamentally a human and moral story, right? Yeah. Well, it's it's an individualist solution that Dickens puts forth. Exactly. He doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't put forth. I would say there is an argument against it is that he doesn't put forth a collectivist solution. He doesn't say, and then Dickens went off to Parliament and tried, I mean, no, Scrooge went off to Parliament and tried to get all these things changed. No, Scrooge just changed himself and made the lives of the people around him immediately better. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of what he's, the message he's trying to get out of this is um, that we can all improve society as individuals and that's kind of the only way that we are going to improve it is kind of the idea I get from it because it's thought you get that quote from Scrooge up top and um, when he's visited by the charity man of you know is there not enough poor houses I already pay my taxes why would I do anything more and it's kind of him learning actually no you, you can't just you pay your taxes you need, to, <laughs> you need to take personal responsibility and um, go out and do uh, some something yourself and do something as an individual. Um, but now we'll come to the final ghost um, that Scrooge is visited by, which is the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Brendan, why do you think um, Dickens makes this this ghost the most scary? Um, I, think it, 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 I think the key reason that's the scariest one is because this is what will happen if you don't change. So there's, so the, the, in terms of the moral narrative here, there's a lot of push and pull. Um, you know, there's sadness, there's sorrow, there's loss. We're encouraged to feel sorry for Scrooge at various times, um, particularly because of his past. But um, there's also a bit of pressure and, you know, the, the pressure comes primarily from the ghost of um, uh, the future, the ghost of Christmas yet to come, who is really saying, listen, it, it's kind of a warning. This is what could befall you if you don't change your way. So that's when we get the kind of um, moral pressure put on Scrooge. And that is a pretty scary part of the story. Um, and I think that's really the role that plays. I think in relation to just quickly to come back on the politics question, I completely agree that to judge to judge a novel politically is always a mistake. Novels should be judged by their narrative, their story, their characters, their moral anchor, if they have one, they don't need to have one. Um, but I think what's really interesting about A Christmas Carol is that it does, um, it does reflect the various social ideas that would have been swirling around London in Dickens' time. And it does that in a way that is not politically um, oppressive, which does not um, take over the story, which does not take over the characters, but it's there. And I think that's really important. But, you know, just to drag George Orwell back into the discussion, one interesting point Orwell makes in his long critique 
or his, his long essay about Dickens and Dickens' work, he makes the point, and I think this is quite interesting in relation to the ghosts, he makes the point that over time, Dickens seems to have become increasingly deflated about the potential for um, uh, charity to solve all the problems facing society. Um, because in, in Dickens' work, very often there's the good man or the good woman, and they kind of lift someone up or, or they help to transform someone. And those are really, really good stories. They always make for good stories because there's good and evil, there's redemption, there's uh, the moral fall, all those things which are very, very exciting. And I think Great Expectations has that most uh, explicitly in so many different layered ways. But over the time, Dickens does seem to have lost faith in the possibility of those um, charitable initiatives to really transform humanity. So that sense of deflation that you see over his literary life, I think is quite interesting and quite telling and, you know, something worth reflecting on. But in relation to the ghosts of the future, I think that this novel in particular is one where Dickens was was very morally confident i think it's his most morally confident story uh it's it's his clearest story it's it's otherworldly it's got ghosts in it. it's a ghost story essentially um but through all that those devices he is able to put forward a very clear moral story about redemption and and the, the ghost of christmas yet to come plays a really important role in revealing the future and revealing the future is always terrifying because it's not something that happens to people naturally you don't get to see your future so that's the part of the story i think where the narrative turns to one of essentially saying you have to change and i think that's why it can feel like a fairly oppressive part of the tale yeah i really agree there that it it is kind of the the final lesson and it has to be the scariest to kind of get through to him that he has to change so i think the the way in which the the final ghost is constructed the darkness is really necessary in order to bring it back home as a personal story, but also to kind of show that like, yeah, the ghosts, they're a reflection of what's going on within you, right? Your own ghosts are the things that you have created. They don't exist outside. And if we relate it back to like ignorance and want, right? As, as the ghost of the present says, he says, you know, these are the creations of man. These are the children of man. Right, which, as Brendan mentioned, they're a so they're created by society. They're not natural. They're not something that are just going to happen because of a lack of resources, and therefore they're just an excess population. Right? These are the products of the ways that the way that society thinks of itself. Right? And then the final part is just like, okay, we have all of these issues. We have all of these problems. What are you personally? not looking to some government, looking to anything. What are you personally at your own level going to do about it? Brendan already touched on this at the beginning of the show. I think ultimately this story is, is a story of redemption, which is a recurring theme throughout literature. But there's one thing that kind of concerns me about um, this is it's such a good message, uh, the idea of redemption and to be able to become a better person. But Brendan, do you think that maybe redemption is not possible in the same way today? Just looking at current circumstances with cancel culture, is it seems that one sin of your past will forever tar you um, and it's so hard to kind of rid you of, of that. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think... It- that's a very important point. We live in anti, anti-redemptive anti times. It's very difficult to achieve redemption now. We live in very fatalistic times. Uh, this notion that people are fairly fixed either by experience or cultural heritage or identity. You know, we tend to judge people by what's fixed rather than what's transformable. Um, and I think the, you know, not only are we potentially cancelled for saying or doing the wrong thing, but we also are increasingly encouraged to bear responsibility for the sins of our fathers. I mean, if you look at the way in which um, in Australia and in the US and in the UK, the idea that, for example, all white people are beneficiaries of slavery and colonialism and imperialism, um, all black people are historic victims, you know, Everything is very fixed. And, you know, speaking of the uh, ghost of Christmas past or the role that the past plays in people's lives, in this story, uh, the past is revealed or the past is visited 
as a means of encouraging Scrooge to achieve a greater understanding of himself and his moral failings and to offer up the possibility of change, the possibility of transformation. But increasingly now, uh, in, in the contemporary period, the past is used almost as a weapon to remind us why we are like we are, why we enjoy the privileges we allegedly enjoy and, and so on. So um, humanity has a very strange relationship with the past at the moment. His, history plays this very oppressive role in our lives. We're all supposedly prisoners of history in one way or another. And I think that's another reason why A Christmas Carol has stood the test of time, because people do like the idea of redemption. They like the idea of being able to assume self-governance, control over your life, the, the moral choice. Uh, and so I think it's still a very stirring story to read, a very humanistic story to read, perhaps now more than ever. But for now, um, I'd like to thank both my guests for an amazing introductory episode of Better Red Than Dead. Brendan, thank you so much for your time. Is there anything that you'd like to plug to our Young Generation Liberty audience to get reading or get involved in? Um, read Spiked. That's what I would plug. Read Spiked every day. That is the place that will keep you sane. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Generation Liberty's Better Red Than Dead. We hope to see you next time. <laughs>